All right, so I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna do a a quick example. Welcome back, by the way. Um, we're we're wrapping up chapter 14, energy work, um, and I just want to do one quick example before I move on to chapter 15, and this is just to tie up that concept that we brought up last class on conservation of energy, and we're gonna start with this problem on the board. And here's the idea: uh, we've got this collar or mass. It's like a slider. And the slider initially is starting at point A along this, along this curved path along with the straight part of the bar. Okay? So it's got two sections to this, uh, to this rod. The slider is connected to a stretched spring at point A. And again, it starts from rest. And what happens is the slider is going to start moving this direction down the collar and it's going to eventually reach point C. Okay? And the question is, what is uh, the velocity of the collar at point C, and what is the reaction force of the rod on the slider at point C? Okay? So that's the idea. And so I'll give you, I'll give you the rest of the, the given information here. Um, I'm using a Greek letter rho to sort of indicate to you this is very similar to a radius of curvature. So imagine this as being a quarter circle, and the quarter circle has radius of curvature or radius rho 0.3 meters. Uh, we're given a, a, a length for distance between B and C, the straight part of the rod, as 0.25 meters. Uh, we're given that the weight, or mg, of the slider is 25 newtons. And what else? So we'll also say that, uh, again, starts from rest, so VA is zero. And we're telling you that there's no friction force between the slider and the rod, so friction is negligible, or we'll say that it's frictionless. Okay, and then spring also has a spring constant K, and spring constant K is 400 Newton meter. And I'll also give you the initial unstretched length of the spring, 0.30 meters. This is unstretched length. So, okay. And I'll summarize. I'll summarize what the questions are. A, uh, find velocity or the speed at C. And B find reaction force at C. Okay, so those are, those are the parameters of the question. Okay, so I'll, I'll, go, I'll draw you a quick, you know, we're going to always start with a free body diagram. Let's draw a quick one right here, and then we'll revisit it later. We're clearly interested in what's happening at C, so I'll focus on the location C. I'll draw my collar like that. Right? And the idea is once it gets to C, the spring is in a completely different angle. And so it's gonna it's gonna pull off this way, right? So we've got a spring force that's basically acting in this direction. Uh, and then what else do we have? We clearly have Mg of the collar, right? And then we have this reaction force. And you can imagine that because at point C, it's the curved part of the path is just meeting the straight part of the path. And so we're just going to, we're going to say that it's right where it's going straight. And we can say that there is a reaction force, let's say F reaction. I'm going to call that an Fn, like a normal force of the surface of the rod acting on the collar. So we're, we're dealing with that kind of free body diagram. Um, and so the issue is, what do we do? How do we, how do we intend to solve this problem where we're looking for this speed v? Okay. All right. So a, a couple, a couple things to, a couple things to note. Obviously, we're in chapter 14, so this has to involve work and energy. But the, even with work and energy, there are two ways to go about it. There's the first way that I taught you, which was the principle of work and energy, which you can certainly do. You could do a T1 is equal to a sum of the work from 1 to 2 is equal to t2, completely OK. But just, just note how complicated that would get. Right? The collar is going to travel in this particular direction, 
And you know that for principle of work and energy, when you do your, your U, the work done, it's always got to be the force with the dot product of the change in the distance. So imagine every single increment of motion as you're traveling along this curved path, you've got a force of spring that you have to deal with, and that force of spring has a different angle with respect to that curved path. So you can imagine that that integral is going to get fairly involved. Okay? What we do know is that a second method where we did conservation of energy clearly allows us to approach it from a different perspective. We can clearly do this, T1 plus V1. And in fact, I'm going to change my subscripts here. I'm going to say that my first position 1 is actually my A. So what I want to do is do a TA plus VA. And then it's plus like the sum of all of the work done from 1 to 2 of non-conservative forces. You'll remember that I did that. But in this problem, we've already said that it's frictionless. So all of this is gone, makes uh, the conservation of energy um, even more ideal to use in this problem. So we're going from A, and then we're going to end up at C is what we're interested in. Okay? And clearly, the velocity of C, the velocity of color at C is buried in this kinetic energy term. And then everything else just, it, it's a matter of figuring out what all the other energies are of the system. Right? So that should, that should make sense to you. OK, is that reasonable? OK, so, so now, now it comes down to finding all of the different energies, kinetic and potential. Easy to start with TA, because that's kinetic energy, but it starts from rest, because VA is 0. So we can say this is clearly 0. And then in terms of VA, that's the potential energy. And what we did last class was we covered potential energy of the spring and potential energy due to gravity. Okay? So at position A, what I could first do is I could say, well, it clearly has to be MAG and then multiplied by the height above my reference point y is equal to 0. So what would that be? That would actually be the whole length from top to bottom rho plus LBC. L plus rho BC would be my entire height. Okay? And then what I would do is I would add that to, so this is my, this is essentially my VG, right? This is VG. Like that. And then now I need V for the spring. And the V for the spring, we know that it's 1 half k. And it's got to be this s squared term for a. But what is s? s has to be the stretched length, the total stretch length. So how do we do that? Well, the full length is rho plus lbc. right? But then its initial unstretched length is s0. So it's rho plus LBC minus S naught. That's the amount of stretch all squared. OK? OK, so I ran out of board space. I'm going to do this. I'll, add, I'll make this equal to my 1 half MAVC squared. Why, why am I saying MA here? This is just M, sorry. There's no MA, just A, just M, just M. All right? So mv squared, mg, OK? And then I'm going to add dot, 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 and I will continue my vc over on this board. My apologies. OK, so plus, why don't I, why don't I do this? I'll add this, to, I'll add this to vc, and then I'll put vc over here. So vc must be Vg at C plus the Vs at C. OK? And Vg of C is pretty easy. This is just Mg again. H above Y is equal to 0. That would be just LBC. All right? And then finally, plus 1 half K. And it would be from here to here. Like the spring is going to start looking like this when the spring is at, when the collar is at C. So now we have to find that length minus S naught. I'm going to call this length here L 
LC minus S naught squared. Let me give you a star here. We have to figure out what LC is. So how do we figure out LC? You just need your geometry. Okay, so this is, this is my LC, the hypotenuse of that triangle, the full length of the spring. And then this is my rho, and this is my LBC. Right? So you can imagine LC is nothing more than LC squared is just LBC squared plus rho squared. So you have your, you have your LC. We're going to plug that in here. And it looks like the only unknown we have is VC. So we're set to solve the problem. So finally, substitute everything. Solve for VC. That's uh, velocity C. And there you have it. Here's your solution using conservation of energy, which really just simplified the whole problem. Um, and I'll say here. Right. I'll just reiterate, because it, it's never a bad idea to just keep reminding you forces, velocities, displacements. Right. Anytime you see that combination, really, really good idea to think work and energy. And if you happen to not have any friction, think conservation of energy. Okay. So that's part A, and then we're going to do part B. Okay, so I'm going to do part B and I'm going to redraw free body diagram. Mg. Uh, and now I'm going to draw my F spring this way. And then I have an Fn, and I drew my Fn this way, something like that. OK, so it's just a matter of force balances. Um, and then how do, we, how do we approach the problem? Should we use xy? Should we use normal tangential? Uh, what, what could we possibly do here? So as it turns out, I'll, I'll just you know, remove the suspense. As it turns out, there was a really important reason why we solved the velocity here. And it's because of the following reason. Right when the rod finishes the quarter arc and starts getting straight, this part right here, it's actually, there's actually no information that you can use on the straight part that could help you solve this Fn bit. But if you realize that on the curved bit, this is actually, there's a, there's a normal acceleration of the collar going around this bend, which is why we use that Greek letter rho. It's because if I happen to use v squared over rho, that gives me my angular, uh, my normal acceleration, my an, which means the best thing to do is use nt coordinates. So we're going to use our fn ft, right? And I'll show you how that works. So what does this mean? I'm going to do fn ft. This is clearly my ut direction, because that's the path of the collar down the rod. Un is concave into the curve. That's my un. And then if I did my sum of FTs, it would be mat. And it would be equal to mg plus the cosine theta, so fs cosine theta, right? And then I'm going to do my sum of my Fn's, Man, 
And you can see what happens here. Now that I, now I know I need my MAN, I can just write this as M V C squared over rho. And in the normal direction, I have both the Fn that I'm looking for, Fn plus Fs sine theta, like that. Okay, and then I'll do, my, I'll do my trigonometry here. Basically, the angle theta that I drew on that diagram is actually this theta right here, right? So that theta is pretty much the same as this theta, and therefore I could find it just from using my tans or my, my sines. So I could say sine theta is opposite over hypotenuse. That would be rho over my LC. Okay, and so I'm going to do some rearranging here. Fn is what I'm going to solve for, and it's going to be mvc squared over rho minus my Fe, so Fe sine of theta and so this would be minus K times LC minus S naught rho divided by LC. Let me just see if I have an LC value for you. Where LC Okay. Okay, so I'll make a quick comment about uh, this equation. I basically just rearranged the terms, but I want to draw your attention to obviously this force right here. The rho over LC is my sine theta, just from the geometry. Fe is my spring force, and I purposely, did I say Fs? Fs, sorry. Fs is my spring force, and what I did was I took your typical spring force equation, k times the amount of stretch, and it's LC minus S naught, and I'll tell you that I already took the signs into account. How do I know? Because look at this, the LC that I calculated, I'm giving you from Pythagorean theorem, 0.3905 is larger than the unstretched length. The unstretched length was 0.3. So after you've done that calculation, you know that the spring in this position is stretched, not compressed. And because it's stretched, the force is acting this way, and you already know the direction of that force. And so when I draw, drew the free body diagram, I took into account that direction. Hence, this is the correct sign, it's the minus sign. You work everything out, and finally, Fn is simply going to be equal to 94.8 newtons. Okay, and so that's your final solution. And notice again, you would not have been able to solve this if you simply did Fx and Fy, because you would have, been, you would have needed to find Ax and Ay. And AX and AY, there's nowhere to approach it. There's no way of finding that acceleration until you realize that the normal acceleration was available to you from the fact that it was coming down from that quarter circle. OK? Easy? All OK? Is, does anyone have any questions? I'm going to end chapter 14 here. Um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, great question. Question was for Fn, why did I draw it this way? You can draw it any way you want. I actually, in my notes, I can show you, I actually guessed wrong. I drew it this way initially, thinking, well, maybe, maybe the rod has a reaction force that pushes the collar this way. It was the wrong, it was the wrong intuition. My sign turned out to be negative. Okay? So you're, you're going to have to do a little guessing in a lot of these problems.
And then one other question up there. Is tensor conservative? Sorry? Is tension force a conservative force? Is tension force a conservative force? Uh, great question. What do you think? <laughs> so tension force, remember, remember the one thing that we did the other, the other day, though. We had two particles connected by a rope. We actually thought of tension as a, um, as a internal force that got canceled. In the case where you want to completely separate and isolate that particle and use tension force, uh, it actually is a conservative force, right? Because here, here's the thing. You've got to think carefully, though, because tension force only exists when the rope is tight. So it's only going to go in one direction with that tightness. And you're, you're meant to integrate that tension force across a distance, right? So all that, all that is fine, except for the fact that you've know, you got you to be careful if you're, if you're turning corners, for instance, and the rope is still stretched, right? Um, you've got to be careful because you're not, it's not easy to do what we did last time with the MGH1 minus MGH2. If you can't, if you can't separate it into those two things, then they're not conservative forces. So I'm going to say, just to be safe, don't, don't treat tension that way. Okay? But it, it can be under special circumstances. Anything else? I saw another hand go up here, I think. Are we good? No? OK, so let's move on to chapter 15. Um, which is momentum and impulse. OK, so here's the, here's the idea. We're, we should be all familiar with the idea of momentum. Momentum is mass times the velocity. Okay? So anytime you see mv, that's your linear momentum. Where does it come from? Let's start where we always start. Oops. Okay, Newton's second law says sum of forces all external to the particle is going to be mass times its acceleration. But there's actually another way of writing it. I could just use the definition of acceleration to say that it is dv by dt. Still vector form, still has its two components or three components. Um, and in the case of a particle where the mass isn't really changing um, and, it's, and it's just a solid particle or a solid body, um, m is a constant outside of that dv by dt term. Okay? So now what I want to do is, last time I talked about work and energy. Work was force acting over a distance. Right? So today's, today's lecture on momentum and impulse, I'm going to tell you that there's a term called impulse, which is essentially the amount of force acting over a period of time. So not distance, but time. Which means I can actually integrate this whole equation with respect to time. Okay? So instead of integrating with distance and marching along how far you are along a path, I'm going to integrate with time. And here's what's going to happen. It'll look like sum of forces times a dt. And I'm going to integrate that from t1 to t2. And that's going to be equal to this integrated over time, t1, t2, m dv dt, like so, right? OK? And what that means is I can rewrite it, t1, t2, sum of forces, dt is equal to, this really boils down to an m dv. And because the, the differential has changed, I now have to integrate from a different limit of my integral. So now I can actually do this mathematically and say, let's integrate from an initial velocity to a final velocity, v1 to v2, at those two specific times. 
And because mass is constant, you end up with this, mv2 minus mv1, all vectors. OK, and now I'm going to rearrange. And we're going to get mv So this is the new equation I wanted to introduce you. This one has very similar structure to our principle of work and energy. And in fact, the name of this equation is the principle of momentum and impulse, where we basically just, re, you know, we've, we've changed the concept slightly to involve time as opposed to distance. OK, so this is the principle of momentum and impulse. And what it says is the following. You have basically initial momentum. Not only is it initial momentum, we say this is initial linear momentum, because this is for all, all particles moving along a path, and we, we just want to know its linear path at the moment. So this is initial linear momentum, and you're going to add it to various impulses. And those impulses, if they're positive in nature, it will lead to an increase in its momentum. So it will have a higher final linear momentum, like that. Okay. What else can I tell you about this principle of momentum and impulse? Whereas principle of work and energy is a scalar equation, as soon as you're done with the dot product, you end up with values that have units of joules, and you can start adding things very easily. This is a vector equation. It maintains its vector nature, and therefore you have to work with its components. Okay, so it will have there's an x component to the to the principle of momentum and impulse, and there's a y component to the principle of momentum and impulse, right? OK, and so where, where is this the most useful? Work and energy, most useful when you have forces, velocities, displacements, right? Newton's second law, best when you need accelerations. This one, forces, velocities, and time. So if I ask you a question which involves these three elements, chances are we're asking you to deal with momentum and impulse, which is, like I said, it comes straight from Newton's second law. We haven't changed anything. The physics is still there. If you want it to, you can always calculate acceleration. You can get the answer. But if you see these three elements, you will likely get the answer faster and more, more, in a more straightforward manner if you use momentum and impulse. OK? And then I'll even, I'll even finish. I want to just condense everything down. Remember how we did system of particles, so two particles um, and, uh, and its work and energy. And then we had internal tension, right, which we just brought up in this lecture again. We can do the same thing. We just apply every single thing that we did for work and energy to momentum. So I'm going to do for a system of particles, Right? How did we deal with it? I told you that we just put summation signs with i different particles in that system. And you would do mi vi1 like that. That would be like saying, add up all of the initial momentum of all of the particles in the system. And then you're going to sum 
across all particles, all of the impulses that are acting. And then that would be just mi vi2. Okay? And that's basically like saying, take this sum of forces as the total resultant force acting over amount of time for one particle, and then just do that for all particle i. Okay? For i particles. Okay, and final thing before we get to examples, there's obviously conservation of momentum. So if Okay, so imagine, imagine a, a case where, you know, this is, the, this is your old high school case for conservation of momentum. It's the billiard balls case, right? So two particles or two billiard balls smashing into each other. And during the impact of those two balls, there were actually no other external forces acting on it that could be considered as these impulse forces, okay? And there's a, there's a reason for it. You can read it in your textbook. The idea is as follows. The forces that are happening between the balls as they smash into each other are equal and opposite to each other. Right? And, then, and then people will argue, well, the balls themselves have masses, so there should be an mg. Okay? So the mg is a force that's external. It's gravity pulling on it, and it acts over a certain amount of time. But what happens there is you'll soon see in all your examples Impulse forces are, are absolutely massive. They're, they're large, large numbers, which make the mg part of it negligible. Okay? So anytime you have smaller forces like the mg, uh, the, the balls are smashing into each other, the time of impact between that, 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 uh, the collision is so small on the order of milliseconds that the impulse caused by an mg of the billiard ball is much, much smaller than the actual forces of the collision. Right? So what we're basically saying is, under those circumstances, if you've decided that there are no external forces, or delta t is 0, for instance, right? Just there's no, um, there's, there's such a short amount of time, then you have sum of all particles i of your mi, oops, mi vi1 is equal to sum m i v i 2, right? And this is exactly what you should be used to from your high school, right? All of the momentum from each of the billiard balls is equal to the final momentum. Momentum is conserved because of those reasons. OK? That's it. I managed to summarize everything that I did for all of chapter 14 and applied to chapter 15, right? A principle, you know, conservation laws, system. I did all of those things within the last 10 minutes or so. And it's, and it's because now I'm repeating myself and I don't want to do that. Just simply apply it for time, OK? So let's do some examples. I'll give you one quick example here, and then we'll move on to more complex ones. OK? Any? Any questions on that? OK, so very basic example just to get ourselves. Let me do Got another, got a flatbed truck here. And the truck is carrying a mass 
that's on the, on the truck and for whatever reason this truck driver has decided not to strap this mask down. Okay, so the truck is traveling at 90 kilometers an hour with a load on the truck bed. So the question is the following, find the shortest stopping time without the load shifting okay, or sliding. Okay? So you know, the truck driver is just really curious to know based on uh, the friction between the truck bed and the mass, if I give you a coefficient where coefficient of static friction is say 0 0.40, coefficient of kinetic friction is 0.35, and do I have a mass? I don't have anything else. I know that 90 kilometers per hour converted is 25 meters per second. And I don't even know the mass of the load on the truck bed. Okay? And he asks a very good question. In his particular case, he's going to try to slam on the brakes. Uh, and he wants to know you know, if he has a certain amount of time to do that, what is the shortest possible time before, before the mass starts to move on him? Okay, and so let's do a free body diagram. Mg, Fn, and of course friction. between the mass and the truck bed, yeah. So let's say the truck slams on the brakes and the whole thing wants to continue carrying forward and the, the, the truck is gonna try to make a stop, the mass is gonna wanna move forward along against the truck bed. So what's keeping it from sliding forward? It's friction that's holding it back. Oh, so you're saying that you wanna just stop the car without like, having the mass go forward? Without having the mass move at all. So, so that, that, that is, that's actually a really good question, right? I've worded it a certain way, but in, in actuality, when I'm asking find the shortest stopping time without the load shifting, the key part is without the load shifting means static friction, right? So make sure that if I give you these two, for it to not move, you have to be dealing with the static friction case. So it's this guy right here, right? I'm asking for stopping time, which means I want time, I'm giving you velocity, and so, it seems to me that the principle of momentum and impulse is going to be useful here. I want to show you how it's useful. Okay, so I'm going to do my typical force of y is 0 is Fn minus mg. That's pretty obvious. And then sum of forces in the x is max is negative ff. And it should be negative mu s fn. Okay? Now, remember what I did here. So far, you, 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 remember that the, you remember that the friction force, if it's static, is actually an inequality. It should be less than or equal to mu s fn, right? So I made it an equal sign because I'm trying to get it to be the maximum possible friction possible in order to get the shortest amount of time. Okay, so that's the reasoning behind that. So I could, I could certainly solve it already, and I would get an acceleration, but that acceleration would be constant. Then I would have to multiply it or integrate it to get the amount of time. I'm going to say go straight to momentum and impulse, and I'll see what happens. Okay, so you can definitely solve it like this. I want to show you why we did momentum and impulse. Okay, so the way you do it is you say, I have an initial mass of the load. It has an initial velocity v1, and I'm going to focus completely in the x direction. So this is all of my x component. Okay, 
I'm going to add it to any external force that is applying an impulse on this particular mass. T1 to T2, sum of all forces in the x is only my negative FF, like so. And I'm going to integrate that to dt. And it's going to be equal to m v v2 x. What is m v2 x when the whole thing is stopped? Zero, right? Because it's a, it's a stopping. So, so the velocity of the truck and everything else is now zero. OK, so now I'm going to carry on with this math. This is now, I've taken the x component, so the vector is gone. Everything is scalar in my component. mv1x plus, and I'm going to pull out my friction force because it's constant in this particular case. I'm going to plug in my mu s fn, but fn is just mg. So it's mu s mg times t2 minus t1. This is the delta t stopping time that I'm looking for, right? So it goes to zero. This is my stopping time. OK? So delta t is equal to mv1x divided by mu s mg. And guess what happened? The masses actually cancel out. It means that this problem was independent of the mass of the load. Delta t is 25 meters per second, 0 0.4, 9.81. Stopping time is 6.37 seconds. And that's your final answer. Any, any questions on, on that? Right? Sorry? Yeah, that's great. OK, so, so you, have an, you have an answer. And remember, remember that my answer was completely dependent on me assuming this equal sign here, right? Equal sign minus, point at, uh, minus mu s fn. Now, this could have been a smaller friction force if it remained static, OK? Like, I could go back and I can calculate this if I knew the mass of the load, right? It would just be mu s mg, OK? So let's assume that it's actually less than mu s mg. What do you think would happen? So it means that this value is a smaller friction force, what would happen to delta t? Delta t would be bigger, because the denominator is smaller. So it means that this has to be the smallest stopping time. If the driver was stopping any slower, the mass is completely safe. He's just taking longer than 6.37 seconds. He could take 10 seconds or 15 seconds. He would travel a longer distance, but he would be safer. Okay. What do you think happens if you tried to slam on the brakes and the time was shorter than 6.37 seconds? The mass would slide, but you can't do the calculation anymore the way you did it because kinetic friction instead of static friction. All of a sudden, you have to use mu k as your friction force. Is that clear? All right. So this is, this is all, like I could, I could word this question any number of way. For, a, for an exam question or an assignment question, I could just say, you know, the driver decided to slam on the brakes in 6.34 seconds, and I could let you figure out first whether or not it was kinetic friction or static friction, right? And you would have to guess one and check to see if it met the inequality condition for static friction, et cetera, right? Yeah. Uh, you have that, uh, right, you have that integral of negative friction force? Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't, I don't know why, why you would do, yeah, certainly. So certainly, yeah, you can check this, right? Here, here's what's going to happen. Let's say I gave you the mass of the load. You would have negative mu s mg. That would be calculated, right? 
wouldn't you say that you would automatically have AX? AX would be a negative because it's decelerating. You could certainly plug in MAX directly in here because it would be the exact same value. Right? So in here is in here buried in there is the sum of all external forces acting on the particle during that impulse time. Okay? And you could do it any way you want. You could keep it as different forces, or you could combine it to make a resultant force. But like, as you do more examples, you're going to start to see what the best method is for certain problems. Okay? All right, that's, your, that's your, you know, your quick introduction to momentum and impulse. I've got examples and examples for Wednesday and Friday. Um, and hopefully I can do one final example on a Friday that's sort of just like, let's just go back to work and energy. Let's throw something at you to see if we can figure it out. Um, and then that will lead into your reading week. All right? All right, see you guys on Wednesday. <laughs>